Welcome to Full Stop Books. I'm Doug, the author of Canon EOS R7 Experience, the comprehensive and user-friendly guide to the EOS R7. Today I'm going to run through the menu setup for the R7, explaining all of the menu items and providing suggested settings for general shooting. Keep in mind that the R7 offers so many options because photographers have different preferences and work in a variety of shooting situations. I have created a detailed menu setup spreadsheet which also provides suggested settings for various shooting situations such as travel, landscape, sports, wildlife, and studio shooting. This spreadsheet can be found at fullstopbooks.com in the link below. All of the menu items and options are also explained in detail in my ebook Canon EOS R7 Experience, available at fullstopbooks.com in the link below. Now let's do a run through of all the menu items of the EOS R7. Starting with the shooting menu, we have image quality where you can set for RAW and JPEG. Turn that off and just do JPEG, turn on RAW, turn off JPEG, or capture both RAW plus JPEG. And HEIF, which is a file format that's going to be captured um, when you use HDRPQ. RAW is a file format that captures the image in an uncompressed file with all of the image information that you've set. It'll be a very large file because it's containing all the information that hit the sensor. If you set for JPEG, it incorporates all the settings that you've set, including the picture mode. So for example, if you set it to vivid picture mode, it would change the color of the images and capture that, and that would be a permanent change to the JPEG image. Whereas the raw image, it, that information's attached to the file, but it's not permanently applied to it. So you could go into Photoshop and adjust the raw image. You can even adjust the exposure by several stops with the raw image because there's so much file information. It's a very large, very powerful file format because you can adjust it so much in post-processing. The CRAW option is a compressed RAW file, so it's going to be about 40% smaller than the large RAW file, but there's very little noticeable difference in the image quality for most images when using CRAW. Perhaps if you're working in a low light situation, there would be some loss of detail in the shadow and perhaps some more noise. But generally in uh, well-lit situations, the CRAW file is going to appear almost nearly as high quality as the RAW file, but it's going to save you a lot of space on your memory card and in your storage and a lot of time transferring files. So if you don't have the space to save the full large RAW files, you could always set for CRAW. Dual Pixel RAW captures files in a format that can be adjusted using uh, Canon software where you can very slightly adjust the area of focus and correct for some ghosting in the image. It creates uh, much larger files than regular files, so you do not want to be using this all the time. And the adjustments are pretty minor, so it's not really worth using anyway. Still image aspect ratio, you can choose to capture image in different aspect ratios, such as square one to one. As you can see, it's going to capture a square image. You can also press the info button to choose masked or outlined. Here we're seeing just the lines that show the image area, and this shows the mask to better view the image area. Typically, it's better just to capture the full image, the 3-2 ratio. And if you want to crop it, uh, crop that in post-processing because this um, would be a permanent change to the file that you don't want to do. So just leave that on 3-2. Exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing. This is used to set your exposure compensation when shooting. And also turn the top dial to enable bracketing. Here it's set for three image bracketing. You can change the number of bracketed images in a different menu item. You can also change the exposure compensation much easier when shooting. You can assign a button to help you change exposure compensation quickly, or you can tap on the screen to change the exposure compensation. ISO speed settings, this is to set your ISO speed, which is also more easily done on the screen or with the ISO button on the top of the camera, but this also has some additional settings. Here's where you would change the ISO speed. This is the available range that you'll have to choose from. If you want to limit that, 
for example, if you don't want to go all the way up to the maximum high, you could lower that down and use maybe 32 or 2500 as your maximum ISO. Um, the high setting is incredibly grainy, so you probably don't want to be using that. So you might want to set that lower, maybe even down to 25.6 if you don't, if you find 32,000 even too grainy for you. Auto range is when you're using auto ISO. It's the range that the camera will choose from. So again, you might want to limit that so that the camera doesn't choose the higher ISO settings. And the minimum shutter speed, um, that's when you're using auto ISO, the minimum shutter speed that the camera will choose. So you could set that for auto and let the camera decide the minimum shutter speed based on the lens focal length that you're using. You want that a little slower or faster, you could change that. You can actually adjust the auto setting or you can manually set that and choose which is the minimum shutter speed you'd prefer the camera to use. HDRPQ is a new feature. Um, it'll create images that have an expanded dynamic range with increased brightness and a wider tonal range and a wider color gamut when viewed on HDR compatible devices. Again, that's not that's something you don't want to be using unless um, you have an HDR compatible device and you want to create these HDR PQ images. So if you turn that on, this is where the HEIF format will be used, where you capture RAW or HEIF or both. The HDR mode, this is the typical HDR mode. It'll capture, th I believe, three images, um, expanded range, and then it'll combine them together. Um, to create an HDR image. So you could either choose auto and let it decide what range, or if you want a really dramatic HDR, set it for plus three. Limit maximum brightness, that is used when HDR PQ is enabled. And you can limit the maximum brightness in case you don't want to capture too high in the, the bright tonal range. Continuous HDR means you capture just one HDR shot or you can keep using HDR until you uh, disable it and turn it back off. Auto align images, it, when it automatically combines the images, it can align them all together, which if you are hand holding, you would want the camera to align them for you. If you were using it on a tripod, they might already be aligned and you might necess not necessarily need the camera to do that for you. And then when taking the HDR images, it could save all the images in the series or it could save just the combined final HDR image. Auto lighting optimizer is a setting that automatically adjusts contrast and brightness to help maintain detail in shadows and highlights of images with a wide contrast range, such as with backlit subjects. This um, would permanently affect your JPEG files, um, so you might not necessarily want to use that if you're going to be adjusting them. Uh, it will not permanently affect the raw files. Also, you can click the info button to disable this in manual or bulb mode because you might not want the camera adjusting your images since you've already put in the settings you want. I would suggest um, checking that box for disabled in manual and bulb modes. Highlight tone priority. This is used when you're capturing images with a lot of information in the in the bright range and you want to keep all those details. So you might sacrifice some detail in the shadows um, but you would capture more detail in the bright ranges which is something you might want to use such when doing high key images or capturing a wedding dress where you don't want some of the fine details to get washed out. So you could set that for regular or enhanced. Again, um, there's a checkbox. When you're using HDR PQ, it recommends that you enable this. So if you do that checkbox, it'll automatically enable highlight tone priority for you when using HDR PQ. Anti-flicker shooting, um, that's when you're shooting under certain types of lighting, such in, as in stadiums, where the flickering would cause banding and um, affect the exposure. If you were capturing a rapid burst of images, the exposure might vary from image to image. So enabling this, the camera would time 
the capturing of the images to prevent the different exposure. Shooting menu three, uh, ex external speed light control is for making adjusting the settings if you're using an optional external speed light. You can enable or disable the flash firing, set the ETTL balance, um, ambience priority standard, flash priority, how it will meter with the ETTL for the flash. If you want it to uh, use inf information from the faces to help adjust the exposure, if you want just the standard evaluative, which evaluates the entire scene or average, um, which just averages for the, the tones of the whole scene. So you probably would want to use evaluative or if you want to use the information, exposure information of the faces, set it for the face priority. Continuous flash control, um, whether it's checking the exposure with each shot in a continuous burst or just using locking the exposure at the first shot and using that for all the shots in the series. Slow sync, uh, you could change the range when you're using slow sync mode. So you might want to leave that fixed at one over 250, which is the sync speed. Actually, it varies depending on which um, shutter type you're using, mechanical or electronic first curtain. So if you leave it on this auto setting, the camera will adjust it properly to depending on which shutter type you're set for. Flash function settings. If your flash is attached, you'll be able to change the functions of the flash through this menu and same with the custom settings of the flash. You'd be able to change it through this menu if your flash is attached. Metering mode is to select the metering mode that you're using when shooting. Evaluative metering, which looks at the whole scene, decide the exposure. Partial metering, which looks at a small, smaller part of the center. Spot metering, which looks at a much smaller part in the center of the screen and the center weighted, which looks to the center to evaluate and determine the exposure, but also looks at the rest of the scene to help set the exposure. So generally you would just set it on evaluative metering unless you're in certain types of situations where you just want to be metering on a certain subject and you want the camera to ignore the lighting levels and the exposure of the, the background or the foreground. Again, this is a setting that's a much easier set. You can use the quick control screen to set that. And then you can actually see partial metering. It shows you the size of that circle that it's using. Spot metering, you can see it's a much smaller circle in the center. And center weighted. You can't actually, cannot actually move the circle so you would aim that circle at your subject lock the exposure and then recompose and take the picture if you're using partial metering or center weighted metering white balance is to set the white balance of the scene here i'm going to set a custom white balance so i can press the delete button to shoot to set white balance i'm going to take a shot and then use this image to create the custom white balance of the scene. So now when I set the white balance on custom, it's going to use that information. So you can see when you change the white balance, you actually can see how it's going to look. With auto white balance, you can choose between white priority and ambience priority, which will give you the more yellowish reddish look of incandescent lighting. Custom white balance is to set the custom white balance like we just did. Press set and it's looking at the last image that you took or that you selected during playback. So if you want to use the data from that image to set the custom white balance. White balance shift and bracketing. If you want to take a series of pictures with different white balancing, white balance, you can adjust it to take it along the blue amber axis or the green magenta axis or if you found your white balance was just a little off with the one of the white balances that you were using you could adjust it slightly generally you just want to leave that alone you could set a custom white balance or set 
a specific white balance such as the natural lighting or the shade, daylight or cloudy or incandescent or whichever situation you're under. Generally, the auto white balance is a great job. Oh, you could also set the exact temperature of the white balance you want. If you were using a certain type of bulb and you knew the temperature of that bulb, you could adjust it here. Color space is to select between sRGB and Adobe RGB. Generally, you'll want to be using the sRGB unless you're experienced with calibrating um, your monitor and your, and your images for printing. You'd use Adobe RGB for magazine work or printed materials, but in general, you just want to stick with sRGB. Otherwise, you might have trouble matching the color profiles when you're between your monitor and, and just general printing. Picture style, this would apply to JPEG images. You could always change this with raw images later. There's an auto picture style, which is use, which will use the information from the scene to decide, or you could use standard or select one of these options. There's even a monochrome, so you could be shooting black and white pictures if you want. But you could always do that in post-processing, so it's not something I recommend doing, especially if you're just shooting raw images because if you shot a JPEG in the monochrome it's permanently monochrome and you can't change that back. So clarity is a newer setting that uh, adjusts the contrast of image edges to give them a softer or sharper appearance. I believe that would also only apply permanently to JPEG images and it's something you could adjust with raw images in Photoshop and Adobe. Adobe Raw has a type of adjustment. Uh, the shooting creative filters, you could capture JPEG images with these various filters, such as grainy black and white, soft focus, fisheye, art bold, water painting, toy camera. You could also adjust many of these. Press the info button and you could pick the warm tone, cool tone. Some of the other ones you generally um, will adjust the the effect high, standard, or low. There's a miniature effect where it adjusts the area of focus where you would move your area of focus to where you wanted it. You could rotate it and then hit set and then it asks you to place your autofocus point hit OK and then take your picture and you get the focus falling off very quickly so it gives that appearance of a miniature effect um, like you're shooting a small model or diorama. Shooting menu 5 lens aberration correction. It makes some corrections to the lens that's attached so it knows which lens you have and it'll tell you if it has the ability to adjust it or not and generally I'd re recommend actually using these ad adjustments if you're using a Canon lens and it has the information um, so it can correct the peripheral illumination which will correct for shadows and shading on the corners of the image distortion control it'll help adjust any distortion that is inherent to that lens um, digital lens optimizer makes other various corrections based on the lens. Oh, a lot of these menu settings, you can press the info button for help and it'll explain it. The digital lens optimizer adjusts um, aberrations caused by optical characteristics of the lens, diffraction, deterioration of re resolution caused by the low pass filter. So it actually is working, the camera and the lens working hand in hand to make these adjustments. Long exposure noise reduction, if you're taking a very long exposure image, if you enable it, it will adjust for the noise. If you took like a one second image, it would take another one second blank image and look and compare where the noise is on the blank image to the, your actual image and then it would help to eliminate that noise. So if you were taking a five second long exposure, it would take another five seconds to make these adjustments. So you don't necessarily want that on if you're purposely doing long adjustment, uh, long exposures unless you're aware that it's going to be doing that. You could also set it for auto where it'll use this adjustment when appropriate times when you're using a long exposure. 
but you'd probably either want to set this on or off depending if you want to use it or not so that you know if it's going to happen or not. High ISO speed noise reduction. If you're setting for the very high ISO speeds, it'll make these adjustments as well in camera for you. It's saying the options are limited. There's a multi-shot noise reduction option that you can use when shooting JPEG images. And it takes a series of, I believe, four shots and it combines them together to reduce the noise. So if you're using a very high ISO in a tripod situation, um, you can make use of that multi-shot noise reduction to get a nice clean image, even when using really high ISOs. Dust delete data will analyze the sensor and look for dust spots and then it'll digitally remove them from the image, from your images. What you would do is you'd put a white piece of paper or a whiteboard and take a photo of that and then it uses the data from that to look for dust on the sensor. What you'd probably want to do is just make sure you have a clean sensor and avoid using this. So use a, a blower. Don't touch your sensor when cleaning it. If you need to do the, the type of wet cleaning or the sticky gel type of cleaning, I would not recommend that, but if you do, be very careful or have a professional do that for you. You don't necessarily want to be touching your sensor and risk messing that up. Shooting menu six, uh, multiple exposure. If you wanted to take a multiple exposure shot, you would enable that and then you would choose how you want the images combined. If it's just adding them, averaging the exposures, prioritizing the bright areas or the dark areas, set the number of exposures, and then if you want to just take one multiple exposure or you want to keep continuing to take them, you can also select an image for multiple exposure, which will be the first image used that's combined to create the multiple exposure. So here I can select one with a pattern for the background. Hit set, use this image as the first one, and then this can be my second image combined. You can already see it combined with the first one. And then if you press the trash can, delete button you can undo that last image if you wanted to or save and exit go back to the previous screen and then I took my third one and it combined it into the final multiple exposure raw burst mode is a newer feature where you can take a incredibly rapid burst of raw images and then play them back and you can extract a single frame that you want from that as your image. So it's a great option to use when capturing some fast action like if you're trying to capture a bird in flight you could basically it's like almost like taking a movie a video of it and then you can extract the still that you want. The pre-shooting is kind of like the live photo on your iPhone where if you have the shutter button half pressed to focus ready to take your image if the bird suddenly takes off and you fully press the shutter button it'll actually capture the five seconds prior to when you oh, 0.5 seconds prior to when you press the button shutter button so that you might capture that exact moment you wanted that generally you would have missed there I took a raw burst you could see it flashing and then during playback, you can choose which frame you want and then save that. Extract it as a JPEG, as a RAW, or as an HEIF. And then it's asking you if you want to view the original image or the one that was just extracted. There it is. Focus bracketing is a feature that takes the camera automatically takes a series of images where it automatically varies the focus distance so if you're taking a very close-up shot of like a macro image of say like the car in in this scene if you're up close you wouldn't be able to capture the whole front to back in focus so this focus bracketing will take this series automatically you have to set how many shots you want the focus in increment, how much it adjusts the focus between each shot, and then exposure smoothing. Well, if the exposure varies from shot to shot, it'll help smooth them to help combine the images together. All these images are going to be combined into one final image where, say, that car will now be in focus from the front to the back in nice sharp focus. So if you're taking macro images of 
objects or insects. You generally want to be using a tripod so that all the images are aligned. The depth composite to have the camera automatically create that composited image for you, which you probably want to do. Otherwise, you can use Photoshop to combine focus stacked images to create the final image. And then the crop option, if the images weren't aligned, it would crop them, it would align them and crop them to make sure um, they're all aligned. Shooting menu seven, drive mode, set for single shooting, high speed, continuous, continuous, high speed, continuous plus, high speed, continuous, low speed, continuous, self timer options. Or self timer, you can even choose, take two images, three images, four images in the self timer burst. This is also an option that's much easier to change using the Q screen during shooting or also using the multifunction button. You can choose which options are here. I have drive mode in here so you could adjust that while looking through the viewfinder without even taking the camera from your eye. Press the multifunction button, adjust whichever five settings you want, such as metering mode, drive mode, even exposure compensation. It's an easy way to change that while shooting. The autofocus modes. Interval timer is to take a series of shots. Set the interval. Let's see, first we have to set it. So here I have set for It'll take a shot every 10 seconds. You can adjust that. And then how many shots you want it to take. And then when you press the shutter button, it'll start that series of interval timer shots. Bulb timer, I have to set this to bulb shooting mode. You can enable that and instead of just having to hold the shutter button down or press it to start and stop, um, you could set the exact time that you want the bulb timer to, for the shutter to be open. That's when using bulb timer mode. Silent shutter function will disable the shutter release sound, operating sounds, and flash use. It'll make use of the electronic shutter. Um, it'll disable the, the autofocus assist beam. So you could use that in sensitive situations where you don't want the camera making any noises or any of its lights flashing. However, there are issues when using the silent shutter because it's making use of the electronic shutter. And so it can cause banding when using it with certain types of lighting and with moving subjects, it can cause distortion. So be careful in the situations where you're using that. For example, you might not necessarily want to be using that at a wedding or a wedding reception because the type of lighting there might put banding on all your images, which would be incredibly difficult to fix. So you'd want to do some test shots before using that in any situation to make sure the lighting isn't causing banding. Here's the shutter mode where you can select that as well. The mechanical shutter is most similar to like a DSLR where it's using the front curtain and the second curtain of the mechanical shutter. The electronic first curtain option, it raises the mechanical shutter curtain before taking the image and that can help reduce camera shake and small camera vibrations such as if you're working on a tripod in sensitive situations or landscape shots or where a small amount of movement might cause blurring in your image. The electronic is what I was just talking about, no mechanical shutter at all for reduced sound and vibration. It allows you to use a fast, faster maximum shutter speed. However, it can cause that distortion with moving subjects and can cause banding with certain types of lighting. Release shutter without card. That's kind of like a demo mode at the camera stores where you could use the camera even though there wasn't a memory card in there. You do not want that to be enabled. So disable that and then test it to make sure you have it on the right setting. Take out the memory card and make sure you can't be taking photos. I think the camera will probably warn you if it doesn't have a memory card anyway but you don't want to think you're taking photos when you're actually not. Shooting menu eight, image stabilization mode. This is to enable a digital image stabilization, which you generally probably don't want to do because it'll actually crop your images a little bit. But if you're in a situation where you have a lens that doesn't have image stabilization, you might want to use that. Otherwise, you'd want to use the image stabilization on your lens. 
And you also, if you're working on a tripod, you want to turn off image stabilization um, since your camera's already stable. The auto level, photo shooting auto level, it's sort of a, a digital image stabilization as well. You can test that out and you can see, tilt the camera, half press the shutter, tilt the camera to the left and right, and you can see the camera is compensating and is keeping the image level. So again, that's gonna cause some cropping in the final image. So be careful in the situations where you might want to use that. But in certain situations where you want to make sure all your images are nice and level and you're hand holding, you might want to consider using that. Customize the quick controls. This again is the quick control screen where you can quickly change autofocus settings, image quality, the drive mode, the metering mode, turn on and off anti-flicker shooting, set the white balance, the picture style, creative filters, and subject detection. So something like creative filters you might never want to use. So you could customize the quick controls, edit the layout, and uncheck the creative filter and then select a different one that you might want in that place, something you'd use more often if you're using HDR, HDR PQ, highlight tone priority, focus bracketing, something that you want quick access to during shooting that you use and turn on and off often. Flash settings. And then you press the info button and you can rearrange them on the screen if you want autofocus in a different spot. Touch sh shutter is where you can um, tap on the screen and if you turn that off, it'll just move the autofocus point. When you touch the screen, if you enable it, it'll move the autofocus point and capture the image. So you might not want that on because you, if you accidentally be touching the screen and it's taking images without you wanting to do that. Image review sets after you take the image how long the image stays on the screen. And viewfinder display if you want the image to appear in the viewfinder as well, which you probably don't because when you're shooting a series or burst or in general, you probably don't want the image you took just took flashing up in the viewfinder between every image. So keep that on disabled. So here's the image review. I'm going to take the picture. It shows it for two seconds and then it goes back to the shooting screen high speed display when you have when you have the drive mode set for one of the high speed continuous then this will be available if you enable it if you're taking a high speed burst through the viewfinder and panning the camera it'll give you a much smoother um, you'll see frame to frame much much smoother if you disable it um, you'll see small blackouts between each shot between each frame so enabling it turning on seems for me is my preference where you see more of a smoother continuous burst of images without the blackout between each one. Metering timer is when you half press the shutter button, the metering information, how long that stays active for um, before it turns off. Shooting menu nine, uh, display simulation is to make these settings apply to the rear screen and the viewfinder. If you set for exposure, then on the screen it's showing the approximate exposure that your resulting image is going to be. So when you make adjustments you can see this is going to be underexposed and overexposed, which is a good thing. You'd want to see that in the viewfinder and on your rear display so you know what the final image is going to look like. If you disable that, you can see I adjust it and the screen brightness stays the same. There are certain situations where you might want your screen brightness to stay the same, but you need to remember that is not what your exposure is going to look like. That would be a dramatically incorrectly exposed image. So the exposure and depth of field, it'll simulate the depth of field, what's going to be in focus and not in focus. It's also going to make your image appear darker when you're using these narrow 
Here we go. Using a very narrow aperture. You can see the exposure is correct, but the image looks much darker because it, it needs to actually adjust the aperture so that you can preview the approximate depth of field. So your actual image is going to be properly exposed, but this allows you to preview the depth of field as well. So you probably don't want that because you're not seeing the actual exposure. And then the exposure only when pressing the depth of field button. So here we can see the exposure is correct. I press the depth of field button to view, preview the depth of field. So it gets much dimmer. This is very similar to a DSLR where it adjusts the actual aperture of the lens. So not a lot of lights getting in, but you're previewing what's going to be in focus and what's not going to be in focus. So I would suggest setting it for exposure. And that way you can preview the approximate exposure of your final image. Optical viewfinder simulated view assist. This provides a more natural view of the scene, but it's going to differ from the actual shooting. So you can see in indoors, it gives it a much more yellowy red incandescent look under that type of lighting, but your actual image might not appear that way. So there's certain situations where it might look odd what you're seeing through the viewfinder, the colors might look off. And so you might want to set this, but generally I would set this off so that you're seeing more closely what the actual image is going to look like. Shooting information display, a whole variety of settings for when you are using the shooting screen, you press the info button and you get different histogram and level, no information, the quick control screen, screen with some information, with more information. So this setting, you can choose what you want. If you want all those views to be available, uncheck the ones you might not want. This setting, you can decide what you want on each of these screens. So this one is that third screen with the histogram and the level. And press the info button and you can decide if you want or don't want those options on it. Screen number two, you could add information if you want. You could add the histogram and the level to screen two. Screen one, you can't adjust that one. So if if you want to change what's on each of these one, two, and three screens, one, two, three, you can use this setting. To adjust that. The viewfinder vertical display option will change how the information on the screen is viewed when you turn the the camera in the vertical orientation. If you set this for on, the screen shooting information is rotated, which will make it easier to read, but it might interfere with how you view the image in the viewfinder. So in that case, you would leave it off and the viewfinder looks the same, whether you're holding it horizontal or vertical. It's just that your, your information won't rotate with the scene in the viewfinder. So try them both out and see which one you prefer. The grid display, We'll turn that on and we can see on the rear screen there's the 3x3 three three grid, which will also be viewed in the viewfinder. This can be actually very helpful. I would recommend use, using the grid in the viewfinder to help keep your images level and to help with rule of thirds composition. There's also a 6x4 grid, a 3x3 three three with diagonal, which is sometimes preferred when uh, shooting movies. You get the diagonal across the middle too, so you can see the center very easily. Histogram display. Here's the histogram. This is the large histogram. You can make it smaller. Or you could set it. It's on the large size now. You could set it for the RGB histogram, which shows all th the three colors, RGB colors. I would suggest just leaving that on the brightness histogram. And if it's too big there and blocking, you might want the smaller one um, if you don't often use it, but you do want it there. You can see it's still there, but it's much smaller. 
lens information display, the focus distance display. You could have that when you're just manually focusing, only when focusing, or always on, or disable it. So I'll put it always on, so we'll see it. And then you could decide if you want that in feet or meters. So there it is. Along the bottom of the screen there, you can see that scale um, showing how far in the distance the camera is focusing. It's probably something you don't want on all the time, except when manually focusing. And the focus length display is enabled here, and that is over near the bottom right, near that zoom icon, you can see it says 50 millimeter. This is a 24 to 105 millimeter lens and it's currently set at 50 millimeter. That might be useful when working on a tripod and you're adjusting the focal length of your lens. You don't have to look up at the top. You'll be able to see what focal length you're set at. Reverse display is if you are using the rotating rear screen, if you extend it and face it forward, like for doing a selfie, it'll reverse the display so it looks more like a mirror image, um, which is easier generally for you to, to look at and adjust the composition. So you probably want to put that on if you're um, using the camera to create selfies in that type of situation. Or when using video, when you're standing in front of the camera and you have the screen turned around so that you can view it. Viewfinder display format, you can select between display one and display two. One shows a larger view of the scene, but some of the shooting information may be on top of the scene. Here, it's a s smaller view of the scene, but none of the shooting information will be on the scene. It'll be over below and to the side. You probably want display one so you can see a larger view of the scene through the viewfinder. Display performance, power saving. It'll be a, a lower resolution, less refresh, but it'll not run out the battery as quickly, but the smooth gives you a better view, although it'll run through the battery quicker. The um, info button to um, suppress lower frame rates, that suppresses uh, the lower frame rates in low light situations so that the viewfinder view will be improved. So you probably want to check that. But again, that will use more battery. So probably want to set that for smooth. Shooting menu 10, movie recording size. Um, for some reason, when you're in the shooting menu, there's a limited selection of the movie shooting settings. So if you really want to switch that top switch to the movie shooting mode and then adjust the settings that you want, and then you'll get the full range of settings. This just gives you the 4K and the full HD options. So you can select between 4K and HD and then your frame rate 59, 29, 23, um, and then the compression is IPB compression. I think all of these settings are also in the movie shooting menu. If you switch that top switch over to, to movie, you'll have these settings and additional ones. Sound recording when with video, you can have it on auto and the camera will automatically adjust the audio level or you can set it manually and adjust it so that it usually you want it to peak around the 12 decibel or disable it if you don't want to be recording sound with your video. So if it's on manual, you adjust your recording level here. So that was peaking too high. I would bring that down to peak closer to the 12. The wind filter, if you want that automatically on um, in situations where it would need it, or if you want that, if you're inside and you know you don't need the wind filter, you could disable that. The audio noise reduction will help uh, reduce the noise, uh, some white noise in the background or the mechanical sounds of the, the, the lens. So you might want to enable that in those situations. This is this ISO speed settings for video recording. Maximum setting when um, using auto ISO. Again, you might not want that set to the very high one because that would be too noisy. Auto slow shutter records brighter movies when dark, uh, records smoother subject movie, m subject movement when dark. So you make that choice based on whether you want it, the brightness to be improved or the subject motion to be better, but it, it might be, the scene might be darker. The auto level is 
similar to the photography, the stills photography auto level, where it's kind of like an image stabilization. When you tilt the camera left and right, the camera will automatically compensate to help keep the scene level. So if you're hand holding, you might want to enable that. But again, it's going to crop the scene because the image stabilization, the, the frame's moving. Shutter button function for movie. So the half press of the shutter button, if you want it, use that to meter the scene or if you want to use it for metering and autofocus either the servo which is a continuous autofocus more similar to like a camcorder or the one shot um, where you just press it once and it focuses at that distance so decide what you want the half press of the shutter button to be during movie shooting moving on to the autofocus menu my Canon EOS R7 Experience ebook is a comprehensive and user friendly guide that explains setting up your EOS R7, the camera controls, shooting modes such as aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual modes, auto focusing modes and subject tracking, exposure metering modes, explains histograms, exposure compensation, bracketing, white balance, as well as Wi Fi, Bluetooth connections, and it covers HD and 4K video. The Companion Menu Setup Guide Spreadsheet provides complete and separate camera guide setup suggestions, recommendations, and starting points for different types of shooting, including general and travel shooting, landscape, action and sports, wildlife and birds, studio and portraits, and concert and performances. The EOS R7 Experience Book and the Menu Setup Spreadsheet can be found at fullstopbooks.com at the link below. So take control of your EOS R7 and the images you capture.